General, think, one of the things that struck me as I was reading it, you're, you have a very aggressive uh, view of Congress's authority under the Appropriations Clause. I'm not saying remotely that that's not correct. But it struck me, I mean, you're Represent, you represent the executive branch as well, and it, it's a very strong power given to Congress. And it struck me that the reason you would want to defend that is because it gives them more power to give away. Um, and they're obviously, legend has it, there have been times when the same party controlled both houses of Congress uh, and the White House. And in that situation, um, you can see uh, Congress empowering the president in a way that might seem unusual uh, uh, to the framers. So keeping in mind uh, uh, that that imbalance, in other words, it's kind of paradoxical. The more power you give Congress, I think, the more, and this is, I think, your friend's argument on the other side, uh, uh, there, there's more that it can give away and enhance the authority of the uh, executive. Um, is that a uh, unpersuasive un, uh, concern? Well, certainly I don't think it's an unpersuasive concern, but built into your question, as I understood it, Mr. Chief Justice, was the idea that maybe Congress could do something that would be surprising or anomalous to the framers. And I guess what I would say is that if, if you're looking at it through that lens, then history should play a powerful role in trying to understand the limits or scope of you know, how much Congress can give away, when does it become too much. And here, the court doesn't need to articulate any outer limits because we have a very specific type of appropriation that's actually far more constrained than many that Congress has enacted throughout history because Congress provided funding for a single agency and actually capped that amount of funding in an amount not to exceed the cap set by Congress. Well, it's pretty unusual to have that agency drawing its being able to request however much it wants subject to a limit that it really hasn't gotten very close to uh, over the years from an entity that is also drawing the money uh, from the from the private sector. Uh, I didn't see any particularly compelling historical analogs uh, to that. Well, and again, and to the extent yeah. that takes you away from the appropriations power, it significantly enhances the power of the executive. So I disagree that there is anything unprecedented about this funding arrangement when you look at the relevant constitutional value of protecting Congress's prerogatives. And I know that there are a lot of different moving parts and pieces to the arguments respondents have made, but as I understand it, they are attacking four features of the funding statute. The fact that it's a standing appropriation, uh, so it remains in place and is not time limited, that it gives the director of the CFPB some discretion to act within the statutory cap and requesting the funding. Third, that the CFPB has enforcement and regulatory functions. And fourth, as your question touched on, that the CFPB's funding comes from a source that's not, con in their words, constrained by market forces. But we have numerous examples of agencies that have all four of those relevant characteristics. I dispute at the outset that we don't actually think the functions or the market forces constraint are relevant, but even taking the argument on its own terms, I can give you founding era examples. The Customs Service and the Revenue Officers were funded with that kind of mechanism. They had standing appropriations for the Customs service, it was uncapped. These were powerful regulatory entities. The Customs Service could board ships and seize vessels and inspect records and conduct searches and levy penalties and collect fines. And there was no way to avoid that kind of regulation. So the market constraint theory that the users could just opt out or regulated parties could decide not to fund the operations doesn't apply to those agencies. And it's still the case with many of the financial regulators today. The ones I would put on that list are the Federal Reserve Board, the FDIC, the NCUA, the Farm Credit Administration, and the FHFA. General? Oh. 